Welcome back, everyone, to the Microsoft 365 Knowledge Series. I'm Paul Therod. I'm here as usual with Stephen Rose, Senior Product Marketing Manager for Modern Workplace Teams and Platform at Microsoft. And our special guest this week is our old friend, Jeremy Chapman, Director of Microsoft 365. Jeremy, how are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, excited to have you. Um, do you mind, maybe you could tell the audience a little about yourself. We we have a, quite a history, and you and Stephen have quite a history. Yeah, so um, I came in, I started out in IT. Um, I came from there into, into Microsoft, and I want to say 2003 first uh, as a partner, and then I went full-time in 2005, started out in the server and tools uh, engineering org, building solution accelerators. So that's where right. uh, we built out things like business desktop deployment, Microsoft deployment toolkit, which it later became and um, was there for a few years. Then I went to Windows, uh, the Windows side, and did basically Windows deployment through the end of Vista and all the way through Windows 7, and that's where I met Steven. Um, right. And then from there, after kind of getting Windows 7 deployed and pretty much uh, all of that that job done, I guess, then we, I moved on to Office to really think about how do we repackage Office in a way that made it more cloud-friendly, You know, work mm -hmm. on the activation, the delivery, and that's where Click to Run and all those kind of things came from. And then uh, based on that work, we started trying to demystify what that looked like through uh, the what was called the Office Garage at the time. And then that later became Office Mechanics. And then we started adding other groups to it um, from Office 365 into the Surface uh, hardware team, mm -hmm. then Azure, and then, uh, and then finally the Windows team was part of it. So now with Microsoft Mechanics, we really span the entire company and we're from a from a subscriber and follower perspective, we've got one of the larger followings at the company with uh, you know with commercial followers doing all the different aspects of deployment, management, all those things. So we create about a hundred different um, kind of instructional or announcement type deep dive videos per year through Microsoft Mechanics, uh, and that's that's what my main my main job is at the moment at Microsoft. Really trying to make sure people know how our stuff works, how they can use it, why should they care. Mm -hmm. and uh, really how to deploy and be successful with our products. So what I got out of that is that we can blame you for click to run and <laughs> more seriously, yes. um, you've been basically involved with deployment for your almost your entire career at Microsoft, it seems. Yes, that's that's why it's in my Twitter handle. Yeah. So I'm deploy yeah. Jeremy. I've been doing nice. deployment even before I came to Microsoft. That was my last my last IT pro kind of project was getting XP deployed out and oh when I was working in China for a German company. But um, that was that was kind of what got me into into the Solution Accelerator org at Microsoft at first. Okay. What was cool was that when Jeremy and I met, we were really going, we have all these great free tools that nobody had known about. And what we did was we really ran out saying, here's how you can deploy. Windows 7, here's how you can get it thrown without having to spend any money. Here's all the really cool free tools. Here's MDT and Map and Act and all these other ones. And it was great because people said, I've never seen Microsoft come to my town and do a whole thing and talk about free tools that are available now. Right. What was always, here's what you have to buy. And it was great because he and I both felt that we had, that we had not seen a great job done with IT pros, where it was always like buy our stuff, and then once we did, we sort of left them behind to really go back and show them how to do this, give them good guidance, and show them these great tools, many of which are free, that they could leverage today. So it was great. So he and I really connected on that, and it really connected with the audience. And it was um, right. it was it was a big change for us in how people viewed us back in 2009, 2010. Yeah, and the other thing, and I still see it today, is um, you know sometimes you'll get something that's that's too difficult to deploy or too difficult to enable or configure yeah. and they'll say oh that's what a partner's for and then like <laughs> my job's done wipe my hands clean yeah. and i always think like if you're the product manager or somebody who's at microsoft saying that's your answer then you've already lost because yeah. you need to get people in it actually bought into the process and at, le at least understand the architecture of how the product works mm -hmm. yes partners then get domain expertise and they're probably more efficient but once you say like that's the only option is to use a partner to do something that no because then what happens is you might have a bench of a dozen partners globally that know how to do something really well and then the rest of the people that you know want to do you know 500 seat deployment or whatever won't be able to even touch it or you won't be able to become a partner to, to get your skills deep enough to kind of qualify for that exclusive crowd of the partner that can help you so, you know, we tried to mainstream everything from a deployment perspective and really, like Stephen said on some previous episodes, 
move from sector-based imaging, you know, ghost and, and those types of processes right. to more of a, a file-based imaging. And, and I, I remember the early, early days of building out the WIM file format and single instance file, files inside of that image and having all the different SKUs yeah. and everything available. And that was actually yeah. pretty cool. And it's kind of a, I would, I would even say it's, to some extent, it's kind of a predecessor to click to run in, in the sense that, you know, we're delivering a set of components and we're, we're looking to see that that manifest of components is available on the computer. And that's the way kind of the WIM unpacking works when you, when you expand a WIM image on a disk. So it's kind of, it's semi close to how we would do the virtualization part within click to run. We just have to do a bit more virtualization with, you know, registry keys and things and different services we need to enable as part of, as part of C2R. Right. You know, this episode is kind of an interesting <clears throat> nexus of things. And it's great that you're here for this because in the original episode, the first episode, we talked about how in that Windows 7 Springboard timeframe, <clears throat> Uh, you folks were talking about what at the time was the modern desktop, you know, Windows 7 plus Office, right? what was it, Office 2013 probably? Um, yeah. 2010. Yeah. yeah. 2010, yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. right. Okay. And, um, you know, how as we move forward now, uh, 10 years or more, um, you know, things have shifted and the modern desktop such as it is, is a different place. You know, the modern work uh, place is a different place. And of course, since we started the podcast series, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic happened and a lot of people are working remotely now for the first time. And this has caused uh, a lot of angst on a number of levels, but for organizations that have to react quickly to this, getting people working remotely and then kind of retroactively um, securing that, which is one thing we talked about in the last episode, uh, but just making sure that people have the tools they need and, and, and so forth. And we thought maybe uh, it would be a good idea to take a step back and and think about how organizations can enable remote work and that, you know, your mm -hmm. work uh, on deployment over all these years is kind of uniquely uniquely suited for this conversation. Yeah, totally. I mean, there, there are so many things and and even just being um, in Microsoft and watching the the transition, you know, there was a time when we all needed uh, VPN connectivity yeah. to get our work done, to, you know, approve expenses, to put things into the system, to find files through file shares. And literally, I mean, I can probably count on one hand the number of times I've needed a VPN uh, connection back to something, a corporate resource that I have to grab uh, in the last month. Like, it, it, it still happens, but it's very rare. And all of our line of business apps, everything's uh, web-based now, all of our files uh, have moved from file shares into, you know, into SharePoint or OneDrive locations. And I think that's that's kind of the main thing is moving away from that. I I, I remember like, and I listened to pod, the one of the earlier ones that you guys did, you know, where the desk phone went away. Like that was an old, you know, thing, yeah. an old vestige, I guess, of office work. Now the file share can go away. And, and how do we then move into some stuff that's more cloud native? And I think that's the that's the bigger kind of long-term goal is to say, how do we maintain all the control that we need, even increase it in a lot of areas, but make sure that our files are at least retrievable in our line of business apps and those kind of things are retrievable through uh, network connectivity that is cloud-based and not you know, having to funnel everything through VPN. Because I think one of the things that a lot of people have learned just in the past couple of months is if I siphon all the connection through that that small straw, that that pipe that is the VPN pipe, that's <laughs> yeah. got to do software updates. That's got to do all of my web traffic. If my users want to go to a, a you know a video site and watch a mechanics video, whatever, all of that has to. And, and a lot of companies uh, go right. through their VPN, and of course you're going to saturate that connection to where there's zero performance. So I think it's been like you know like those old cartoons where people put their fingers on the various holes in the wall trying to say, okay, <laughs> yeah. how do I get enough um, things going through that to where, you know, traffic that makes sense, whether it's Teams or video calling or other things to be on a, on a second or split tunnel. And I think what, what one of the things that we learned even at Microsoft, uh, even though we've been on this journey for many, many years, is how important it is to make sure that you've got a secure way to basically service your, your end customers, your users in IT without having to get everything or make everything go through that VPN so that you're you're thoughtful about it. And I think that's that's part of the part of the reason why, you know, we always harp on things like multi-factor authentication. I think hopefully people respect the the value of, of MFA at these, this point. But so many other things that you can do to protect files down to the file level and you know, files down to the folder level, whether it's email, whether it's chat, all those different things. 
just to make sure that you still have that same kind of control or better control than you would have had in terms of making everything happen within your perimeter. Yeah. And I keep hearing from IT pros, you know, I don't want to lose control. And then you're like, you're not, you're gaining control. Once you move stuff into SharePoint, once people have stuff in OneDrive, it's going to, you're going to have more control where things like DLP and AIP and all these other things kick in. So, you know, you can protect all of those endpoints. You have an know exactly what's coming in, what's coming out, how people are working, and you're giving people that choice to be able to work from any device and not limit them to this one that you've locked down. So it's also part of that switch in mentality and moving away from that. We're going to keep it on the X drive and not let you do this. But right. like Jeremy was saying, the amount of bandwidth that you end up having to to crack is just crazy. It's insane. Yeah. And in, in what I'm sharing here, and maybe you can. So one yeah, of the things that we've done even yet. recently um, so basically one of the things that we've done in the last couple of months, and if you read Alex Weinart's post from last November, I want to say, yeah, we were replacing security baselines with security defaults. Now this means that any net new tenant that's created for Microsoft 365 is going to have MFA configured. And that's a big deal because, you know, in terms of going from like normal single factor password authentication to MFA, we like to say it's, and we've got data to prove it, it's 99.9% .9 plus effective on credential-based attacks. And I think it's in the high 90s on attacks overall because passwords, especially when mastered in the cloud, are things that are fairly you know, easily targeted, hacked, you know, phishing, phishing schemes, those kind of things to get uh, brute force, password spray attacks, those types of things. So that's a big deal. Um, another another thing that, you know, as I mentioned, our, our VPN, there's a great blog here. Um, from from Lucas, uh, it's basically going through all of our our own implementation of our VPN to handle kind of COVID nineteen and the increased demand that we had, and you know we we've seen just in terms of in terms of payoff um, connectivity success rate uh, has gone way up. Number of concurrent sessions two hundred thousand. I mean all of the different employees that we have one hundred twenty eight thousand employees. Uh, that we're that we're managing through it. Everything that we're doing through VPN has been, you know, we, we've we've been able to succeed effectively because we've got the split tunnel and most of the traffic going through um, kind of public connectivity. So we don't have to have as much traffic going through VPN. So it's actually it's it's quite good in that sense. The other things that we can do, you know, in terms of thinking about how we holistically protect, you know, our environment. We've got tools like uh, Azure Sentinel that will help um, in terms of protecting, or I, I should say monitoring uh, any of the activities that you have across your apps. You can do things like um, app proxy uh, as part of Azure AD to really monitor the traffic. So if you do have cloud-based apps, you are you are wanting that kind of um, that kind of networking uh, security blanket that you've got in terms of some of the uh, on-prem networking resources that you're using now. These are things that you can do in order to have, again, a, a split tunnel, a lot of public uh, traffic going through, but then having the same the same visibility into all the different connections that are happening. So this is a big deal. Um, let me go back to let me go back to this desktop. Um, and so, so I mean, these are some of the things that you can do just to make sure that that you can that you can basically survive and and thrive in a in a world where you know the VPN might not have enough throughput to handle all the connections to all the different services that you're using. So I think this is one of the main things long term is just to make sure that you can handle you know public traffic and use those resources as, as best possible. And I'll, I'll go into some other some other capabilities in a sec, but these are these are some main kind of um, long term principles. And then then we'll drill into some of the other technologies here in in the next few minutes. Great. Great. So, uh, we also, you know, we had uh, talked earlier about this notion of uh, variable trust, which I think is really interesting because it's not just conditional access, which um, is part of it, but there's there's a whole uh, other world around there uh, of app control, uh, SharePoint and OneDrive, device-based uh, control and so forth. I mean, can you speak yeah, a little yeah. bit to that? Yeah, so um, with conditional access, I mean, it's it's a kind of a family of options that you have there. On the SharePoint side, for example, you can say, I want to trust certain IP ranges or I want to trust certain users or devices. 
And if, say, a device is unknown to me or it's it's not considered a, a trusted device, we can basically start to tailor uh, what you can do with any assets that you find through SharePoint. So, for example, uh, if I just want you to be able to view a document on a home machine and but not be able to print it or download it, these are things that are now native inside of SharePoint Online. So. Um, this is super pertinent from a work at work from home kind of perspective because there's a lot of these, um, you know, you've probably gone to the closet and found like your old laptop from yeah. years ago. Maybe Stephen and I helped you deploy it to Windows 7 <laughs> back in 2010. Yeah, but... um, when you fire that up and basically try to connect to Office 365, it's going to do all the different integrity checks and health checks against the system. And if, for example, it, it sees, hey, this is not a managed or known device for us, you can actually tailor the experience so it's safe for your files and your information so that you might be able to view something if it's a if it's a browser and the machine's up to date and all the things that we want, but you won't be able to actually take that file down and load it uh, onto the machine or, or, or print it, for example. Those are big deals. Plus, if you think about conditional access on the device level, we can then look at things uh, like, like that as well and say, okay, this device is just not healthy enough to even <clears throat> log in through Azure AD. Right. So you have to go through a number of different, um, you know, software update passes, different things to get that machine to a state where it is actually deemed healthy. And that's what kind of the device based conditional access will give you, as well as some of the um, other things like risk based login. If, if you've never logged in from, you know, from Russia or from North Korea and now you're logging in, we'll be able to see that. You know, those are the kind of things that we can check or even if it's not not those uh, not those locations or even if I'm just now in Europe all of a sudden like how did that happen between you know in the last six hours yeah. um, those are the kind of things where we can flag it and then we can say okay based on this unusual login activity we're gonna we're gonna up you to a second factor of authentication or block you um, and you know beyond that we can even do the app you know app level conditional access too to where we, um, we can basically say which apps are the right apps to be connecting to services. So one of the things that we often show in demo is like, you've got a Tor browser, for example, and you're connecting to services. A lot of times we'll de determine that Tor browser isn't an app that we wanna be able to connect to services. So we can either block or mm -hmm. in the same way, you know, up, up it to a multi-factor of authentication. So there's a lot of things that you can do on that side that's really kind of tying that uh, kind of Intune slash Azure AD capability to really assess the login, assess the situation, and then on the fly determine whether or not we want to, you know, give you access to that, or we deem it less risky, or, or the risk is low enough to actually give that access. And that's one of the things that we can do with conditional access. It's a super cool uh, bit of technology, but I, I don't think you know everybody has it deployed at the moment. It's something that a lot of people can really benefit from. And this is going to be key when you have guests that are coming into your network, you're working with vendors, because now you can say with that in Azure B2B, really not have to sit there and create all these guest accounts and go through this. You can much more easily say, hey, you're here. This is what you can do. I'm going to take my base level for my employees and just not allow you to do these 10 things and very easily scale that up or down to give the right level of permissions without having to start create all these secondary networks and all this. It just... It gets so, I was you know, chatting with people during build in my session and the things that they were doing to allow people access, I'm like, why not just do Azure B2B conditional access and just set this up? And they're like, I can do that. I'm like, yeah, and it will make it so much easier to make sure that people meet your requirements for the network without having to go through a ton of extra steps. Yeah, I mean, I think the scenario that Jeremy had earlier where, you know, we, we all come home all of a sudden and, well, well, what do we have, you know, that we can right. use to work on is is probably one of the more common scenarios that has occurred. And so the fact that you can trust that computer to whatever degree based on where it is with security updates and so forth and whether, you know, how you sign in uh, is super important because I think a lot, a lot of people are going to run in, into that exact scenario. Um, and you spoke earlier about cloud native, which I love, and but also cloud for um, document storage is mm -hmm. super important mm -hmm. as well. This kind of speaks to the end of the X drive <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, bit that Stephen talks about. So, uh, what's going on with uh, with cloud based document access um, for organizations? Well, let me. I'll start on that, and then I'll let Jeremy pile on. I mean, the big thing, and again, it was a question that popped up and built last week, so it was great. Was we have great free tools like the SharePoint Migration Toolkit. 
The okay. SharePoint Migration Toolkit, SPMT, you can take your X drive and you can move it to SharePoint. And what's great is you say, hey, HR, here's your group. We're gonna move all that content over there. So things that are gonna be shared by need to be accessed by multiple people. It's right there. You're not gonna need a VPN to have to, to go into it unless you've set it up that way, but don't have to sit there and start mapping drives. And then people's personal data, you can use the same tool to move it into one drive. And what's great is not only is it there, not only when you log into a new machine is it there, but like I said, I go to my iPad, I click on desktop, there's all the files, everything's in sync, but we also have protections. A lot of folks are not aware that we have malware protection, ransomware protection built right into um, OneDrive. Let me see if I can share my desktop here. So we'll do that. Let me know when you guys can see that. Yep. Awesome. So by going here into OneDrive and, you know, by clicking on settings, I'm going to pop up, uh, you know, right here into my main OneDrive and I'm going to pull you down and by clicking on the little gear up in the top right hand corner. So I'll show that you'll see right next to your person there that there is a gear that will pop up. There we go. And if you click it, go to restore your OneDrive. And this will show you every file that you have deleted, changed anything in the past, for the past 30 days. So we can pick all these files, a single file, and we can yeah. restore that back. And what's great is if you got hit with ransomware on Friday at 11 a.m., you could say, I wanna go back to 1059 on Friday. Every file, every folder, everything will be you know, put back to exactly that point. And most this folks is, don't even know they have, they have this. Right. I mean, this is cloud-based file history, uh, which is kind of like that time machine effect where you can, right. like you said, go back. That's amazing. That's an amazing yeah. capability. And the fact that it's in there is there. The fact that if, you know, you, uh, for some reason, you know, if OneDrive finds that you suddenly have a ton of files that are being rewritten, it will actually stop and say, what's going on? Is this something that you're doing? It'll say, are you aware you just threw away 2000 files? Or if it sees a lot of files being rewritten, our anti-malware kicks in, it will stop, it will take a look and it gets user involvement. So you have that protection and don't need to worry about that. And that's built in as well as Vault and other great features in there. And that goes across SharePoint, OneDrive and Teams because it's that same back end of that. Right, right. Yeah, and the, the things in terms of the number of controls that you have uh, are actually amazing from a from an IT pro perspective. And it's going to take a second for my screen to pop up, I think, based on the last uh, attempt at sharing. Um, <laughs> but basically, basically, you have these nice um, sliders. There we go. So we have these nice sliders where you can actually say in terms of external sharing, you know, what, how much how permissive do you want the sharing to be in both SharePoint and OneDrive? So these are the things mm -hmm. that we get asked about all the time. Like, okay, I, I trust the people that are inside of my domain, but I don't want people sending uh, sending mm -hmm. files outside my domain to my competitors or others. And you can do things like um, targeting with an allow list of the domains that you want to allow sharing to happen, like with your best partners. And I can anti-target, for example, and say like, if my if if I'm Contoso and my arch rival is Fabricam, our two favorite companies, <laughs> um, then I can actually block any sharing to Fabricam. So this is all this is all real stuff that we can do, that really you know helps in terms of how people share. And the other thing is, what are what are some of the defaults that you get? Because when you click like copy link or share, and you get these different um, sharing options, we can choose what the defaults are as part of that. So I might have a posture where I say. Yeah, I want everybody that's a full-time employee of my company to have access to that file by default, and you have to select, you know, down-level that to maybe the individual person you're sharing with. Or you can go the other way and say, I want it. No, when somebody hits um, share and copy link, it's going to start with just the explicit person I'm sharing with, and then I've got to up-level that um, into other, you know, to to larger populations of users. So we have all of that control, and this is the kind of the access controls I was talking about where. You have the ability to say um, again, manage things that are coming in. If if an unmanaged device is coming in, I can I can do a limited web app, web access only. This is where I set that control in the SharePoint Admin Center. Um, I can automatically sign people out if somebody reports their device is stolen. I can uh, sign them out of any active browser sessions so that they'll 
they'll um, be out of out of SharePoint Online or OneDrive uh, network locations, so IP ranges that I trust. And then if you know, I've got apps, and this is going back to our Office 2010 statements earlier, um, that don't use modern auth, I can actually block those from connecting to services here right from the admin portal. So there's a lot of control that you have really down to the file level to make sure that your information stays protected. And all the stuff is is really easy to kind of turn on through uh, SharePoint Admin Center and also the OneDrive Admin Centers. Yeah, and if you have any DLP policies that you've set up for Exchange, by just pushing a single button, you can now extend those out to SharePoint and OneDrive as well. So all of that connects up. And that's really the key thing is you're really looking at a single pane of glass to now manage all document sharing across all mm -hmm. those different surfaces. Right. And one of my favorite things that kind of, and we just did a show on this uh, this last week, that kind of comes out of this is once everything's up in the cloud and can be indexed and, and searched, you can actually start to enable Microsoft Search, which is kind of a derivative of Bing and something right. that you can use to not only find your, your different files, people, even floor plans, and I'll show you what that looks like in a sec, um, but you can actually find everything that you Okay, come on. There we go. That's where I want. Um, you can actually find information that you're that you're looking for across the internet as well as the intranet in one place. So, let me just show you what that looks like. So, I'm going to open a new tab um, with search, and let's say I'm looking for um, information about a 401k. And so, if I do if I do that, what will happen is it will actually search and it will find. Make sure I'm in the right tenant here. There we go. It will actually find information in my in my tenant, and it's it's populating here. Get a, a bit of a, a connection issue, I think, at the moment, but um, it will actually populate both internal search results along with kind of the public web search results. There we go. And if I search for, and this is right from the address bar, if I search for, say, a colleague, our favorite our favorite demo colleague, Adele Vance, um, you'll see that it will find everything in terms of her you know office location those kind of things uh as well as uh even like stuff from azure active directory the organization uh that she's in files that i have access to and permissions to i can see all of all of that information as well and there you go um and any any upcoming uh, appointments or you know meetings that i have with adele i can actually see those here there we go i think we've got a project tailspin uh uh meeting coming up all of that's there in, in search, so it's actually pretty cool integrated, and you still get the public search results as well. Um, and then and, we and, just... and we get to learn that our favorite movie is The Legend of Bagger Vance, which is terrifying, but good. <laughs> that's a I great, that great movie. Right. That's how you can tell it's a fictional character. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so, in something new that we've added is this what we call the work vertical. So this this gives you all of that work stuff in one in one kind of view, and then you can actually navigate through it here. One of my favorite capabilities, though, is uh, you can actually have a look at, you know, if you need driving directions. Like this is this is where for us it's uh, always interesting at Microsoft to be able to find the various buildings that we have across Redmond. Right. And here, I'll do a search for Millennium, and Millennium is one of the harder buildings that we have to find because it's actually in, um, you know, in Redmond, kind of in the uh, Redmond proper Whole Foods kind of area. But all of this will actually give you a map, and you can you can use this to get directions for how to drive there. And then we can even do if we want to do floor plans, we get the ability to even say, okay, I know somebody's at Millennium 1260. I can even see where their office is. So if I'm if I'm either in my computer or in my phone, it works. If I'm signed into Bing on on the phone and sorry Edge on the phone, I can actually see exactly where that person's office is as I'm going to you know, look for Adele or, or Megan Bowen or any of these uh, people that I that I search for in the, you know, in the directory through through Microsoft Search. So these are once again, once your files are in uh, OneDrive and SharePoint, these are other options that kind of open up to you in terms of being able to find content more easily and kind of lower the barriers to get to get work done and to find what you need to find, uh, you know, through a normal search through the address bar even. Right. And that's also going to power things, you know, similar to what we see with Exchange Online, where now you can go into the Outlook mobile client, do a simple search, and not just find emails from people, but all of that. It now brings that across all those all those right. different 
apps and devices and platforms. It's also worth pointing out that one of the many nice things about the new Microsoft Edge is that it supports work and uh, consumer profiles. Yeah. And uh, when you're signed into a work profile like you are here, you get this Bing Microsoft Search experience, which is great. But even if you're signed in as you know your consumer Microsoft account uh, profile, if you hit a uh, a work website, it will auto switch profiles for you yeah. uh, and pass through that authentication. Yeah, it's yeah, much the, smoother as you start to do that. And that's relatively new, but yeah, I once you realize what it's trying to do, it figures that out intelligently. And I went from a work I was signing into buy something personal and it switched me automatically. So again, it's that under yeah. because it's smart, it knows when it needs to go back and forth, which is great. And that's yeah. good for working from home because yeah, uh, you know absolutely. the reality is people are gonna be switching back and forth, you know, between yep. their personal and work needs. As they browse. Another and another kind of thing that another favorite here, and this goes back to our our deployment days for Windows. Um, you can actually define acronyms. Ooh, hold on, I need to go into all. You can actually define acronyms for um, things that you're searching for. Like for example, if I'm searching for MDT, and now that should, after this page loads, show up the work related uh, acronym. Let me try it again just to make sure, because I did define it. Um, for for that right through right through search and just to show you after that loads if it does maybe it won't cooperate this time but um, here's where you configure everything so this is all done through the admin portal in Microsoft 365 and Microsoft Search um, you can set up all your um, acronyms bookmarks the floor plans that we saw earlier locations which were the map location like for Millennium. In about a day or so, you can get all of this stuff configured, and you've got that super powerful kind of search working across, you know, all of your all of your files and all of your office locations, all your terms, all your internet, to where anybody can find what they need. So that this is one of my one of my favorite new capabilities, and it's kind of funny when it started rolling out at Microsoft. I thought, is this just an internal thing that we can use at Microsoft? <laughs> it turns out yeah. <laughs> everybody can use it. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is one of the greatest uh, things that you folks, Microsoft, have rolled out in a while. Um, that's just really impressive. Speaking of impressive, <laughs> we should move along to uh, Microsoft Teams. And this is something that's kind of personal for me because my organization is in the process of uh, switching over to Microsoft 365 and Teams. And, uh, you know, it's a new world. And, and Teams is not just an app. It's a platform. There's a lot going on there. And specifically for the kind of remote work, work from home uh, scenario, obviously people are going to be having meetings online. They're going to be collaborating uh, remotely. I mean, can you folks speak a little bit to that and how that works? Yeah. So with Microsoft um, Teams, it's been it's been huge in terms of the just the amount of uh, the amount of traffic, the amount of usage. The, this the people that have been using Teams, especially in the last few months, it's been crazy. I think you've spoken to the kind of the different updates in terms of the user counts uh, in the in the past few uh, webcasts that you've done. Right. But just just the number, you know, of, of sheer like meeting minutes that are happening at the moment, it's unprecedented. It's um, it's been a huge enabler, and I, and I think that. You know whether you're whether you're using it for chat, whether you're using it for online meetings. I think the the strongest part for me, especially vis-a-vis -vis some of the other options, is just the deep integration that's there between uh, things that are in Office 365 and Microsoft 365, and just being able to kind of hop through all of that, as well as even your line of business apps or any Power Apps or things that you're building, all in the one kind of Chrome, the one construct um, of Teams. So it's it's a fully integrated. We used to say it's kind of a chat-based workspace, but it's more it's more than that. It's a broader collaboration app that has, you know, basically connectivity points to all the other apps that you use in the span of a day. So I'm yeah. literally living in Teams probably, you know, 10 hours a day myself in terms of just hopping through all the different meetings and files and things that I'm working on. Yeah, oh, at, I, at, at, at Built last week, we saw some amazing customers and how they've either built low-code, no-code apps that they've gone ahead and dropped in. We've had end users basically say, hey, there's a SQL database of stuff that I want to be able to leverage on my mobile phone and dropped it into Teams as well as what we're doing around first-line workers and bringing the graph and intelligence into it. So as people start to look at it not as this 
uh, as Jeremy said, this chat app, but look at it as a platform that we can build upon, that we can add intelligence to. You can bring in photos and have AI take a look at it, make a decision on what happens based on what it sees in that photo. It really starts to open up some interesting new ways to take a look at simple business processes and how to reduce the amount of time or manpower it takes to go through some of those so you can really spend the time deciding how do I leverage this and use this. Yeah, yeah. I, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was going to say, and the other thing that I've I've loved to see, especially over the last couple of years, because we were there from the very first kind of beta time frame, you know, the preview announcements, I should say, um, the amount of control that you have in IT is, you know, this is one of the things I think that really sets it apart from other, other options is that, I mean, I'm showing the admin portal here, but um, just in terms of managing teams, um, you know, you've got you've got all of the teams management, device management. You know, what users can see, the policies. If if you don't want um, the giphys to be too fun, like those kind of things, if you're in a conservative, all of that stuff, and even things like data loss prevention. If I'm trying to chat credit card information, those types of things, we can right. control all of that through all the different admin controls that we have through Teams. So. What you're seeing here is really the work of several years of you know listening to people, listening to IT organizations, and adding you know very granular, very detailed control over how Teams is used, how the various experiences within it are used, and you can. The cool thing is you can differentiate policy, so I can I can scope it all the way down to a user, or I can scope policies up to entire departments or countries or however I want to split that up. But I have I have a really almost infinite number of configurations, things that I can do with it, and we do have a lot of great guidance to you know to not lock it down too much. Or do, there are things that you can do that are probably overboard for a lot of a lot of companies. But um, we do we do give you all the options to be able to set up a very secure environment across all the different things that you can do within Teams. Yeah, yeah. People who have been listening to this podcast are probably already tired of me comparing uh, Teams to Outlook and and this notion that Teams is the new Outlook. But in many ways, you know, Teams is the new Windows. <laughs> it's it's it, that, where yes. you run your apps. It's where you are. It's where you collaborate with people. It's it's becoming everything. Yeah, yeah, it, it yeah, is, it, it is a platform more than an app, and I think that's yeah. the big difference that people are starting to figure out that more and more of my day is being spent in teams and there are opportunities to increase that and to add depth from you know on an end user uh, uh point of view yeah. right and that's kind of like jeffrey snover who's our technical fellow now and i'm one of his biggest fans i think in terms of his powershell days but sure. like his his move into uh into microsoft 365 into rajesh's org it's it's huge, and he's he's also thinking about it. We did a show at Ignite that was kind of he called it the people operating system. Where if you think about how Windows is constructed with its uh, various APIs and you know application front end services, all of these kind of things at a very macro level, that's this is kind of representing that. If you tie in you know underlying services like Microsoft Graph for the kind of search components, Teams, you know, and all the various pieces there. There's a great there's a great analogy, like you said. It's like a, it's like an operating system, but at a massive scale and across all these different services. And so, even when you think of right. the different dialogues, like the sharing dialogue or the people cards or those things, we're sharing that across the various services in Microsoft 365. So it's all it's all very uniform and consistent. And these are the kind of things that you strive for in an operating system as well as you build those pieces out. Yeah. Right. Right. So I guess shifting gears a little bit, uh, you know, Microsoft 365 is kind of a massive uh, suite of services that spans beyond what was available just in Office 365. Uh, also includes Windows 7 capabilities, oh, sorry, Windows 10 capabilities, and uh, uh, capabilities that used to be associated with Intune and Microsoft's other management, uh, endpoint management uh, solutions. Uh, what's going on uh, in that space uh, with Microsoft 365 today? Oh, the, the, oh, go ahead, Stephen. Oh, I was just going to say Endpoint Manager is really kind of our, our end-all, be-all for folks there. But go ahead. You take it, Chairman. Um, this is this is like where I grew up because I, I started out doing, um, uh, even in the old days of SMS, uh, not short message uh, service, no, the <laughs> system, system management. Um, so I, even growing up in that in that capacity and, you know, through the days of Configuration Manager and uh, that name change back in, in 2007, 
um, and you know, building out the deployment tech. Now we're at a space, uh, you know, with Microsoft Endpoint Manager, where we've truly got the best of both worlds in terms of Config Manager, which is basically able to do anything. Um, it's got all of the, you know, supersedence and all the different app provisioning capabilities, operating system deployment, you name it. Um, on the Intune side, you know, we've we've done a lot of work, especially recently, in terms of what we what we call co-management, or it's still called code co-management. But now I can even do um, attach effectively my my CM database up into Intune, where I can do things like um, device policy, um, you know, force device policy check against various devices. I can do all the, a lot of the stuff that I would do from help desk that I had to have a you know console uh, access to for Config Manager. A lot of those things um, are available through Endpoint Manager. So, what you see, and this is this is now, and we've changed the URL. It's now endpoint.microsoft.com, is really this um, this bringing together of of you know Intune along with uh, Microsoft Endpoint Configuration Manager. It's its new name to really have all of that capability in one place. And this is where you're going to do things, you know, not only around security policy, but even um, you know for deployment, and we talk a lot about things like um, auto autopilot for deploying out Windows devices. That's where you'll configure um, your autopilot profiles, for example, through through the portal, through um, through Endpoint Manager. So all of those, all the devices that you're managing that are trying to get access, and, and we talked about conditional access earlier, that can be configured here as well. All of these things can be done um, through. Endpoint Manager across different OS platforms. So you know we have you know Windows Windows devices, and I'll go into enrollment. Um, but this is where this is where you can set up all the all the different policies around uh, enrolling the device into into the in, Intune service, uh, setting up Hello for Business, setting up autopilot uh, rules and and profiles. All that can be done here in one place, and then you can even have visibility over over effectively what you have on-prem. And then some of the other things that we've done on the Config Manager side, and I actually have a VM running of Config Manager, I didn't start up, but um, when you start to add things like Cloud Management Gateway and um, basically deploying updates from the cloud, you can actually, again, reduce rel reliance on VPN because you're delivering not from your distribution points, you're delivering from basically cloud distribution points, your software and app updates um, and app packages. That you would have had to have in the in the past forced VPN uh, connection on, so this is another even another way to pay off. You know, doing things that don't require as much connectivity back to your internal perimeter, and these these technologies again have radically been improved and just kind of merged together in a way that gives them a lot of a lot of power and a lot of things that you can do and, and now recently we've even added things like shell script support for mac um you know there's the yeah, mac deployment in general uh, there's a lot of there's a lot more capability in terms of getting apps on onto mac there's built-in the edge browser packages office packages that you can do so there's a lot that you can do through the web console alone and then when you add config manager to it you know, you can basically do anything, um, and that's that's what I love. And the the nice thing with this is everything supports the best levels of automation. Or if I want to ship a patch out or an app out to a hundred thousand users, you can expect that that will be available on those devices as quickly as it can be done through the physics of getting those bits onto those devices. And this is the kind of power that you have in terms of whether or not you want to do policy or you know other provisioning. All of this can happen through um, through the endpoint management suites. Hey, Jeremy, can you go back to the devices page? So go back one up at the top. I can. I don't have any devices enrolled in my no, demo. No, that's tent, okay. So just just go to where it says devices um, up one level. Oh, devices here. Yeah. Yep. Sure. And what's great is there you'll see iOS, iPad, Mac, Android. All of that is in there as we take a look at this by platform and what you're looking to manage too. And that's something else too where it's not separate or off on something else we brought all that in to really allow you to look at your organization holistically and not oh let me just get my pcs done now i'll go look at everything else and have to look at you know different tools to do that that's the value of having that all together and again that going back to that single pane of glass where we can start to see for hey this seems to be hitting only my max i got to take a look at this or this is hitting mac and windows and it must be something at a higher level or etc to really help you to be proactive rather than reactive 
So and the other thing I love about this, and there's this kind of shared underlying set of APIs and services that we use that are kind of spanning Azure AD um, and what you can do through the Intune service, whether it's policy management, we've added ADMX support even for group policy through uh, the Intune service, which is awesome. Uh, but we've also added uh, a service called the uh, Office Cloud Policy Service which basically does cloud policy management for Office. So if, you, if you're familiar with this tool, which is um, you can get to it at config.office.com, you sign in and basically you create um, settings files for how Office will be deployed for, for um, the click to run packages. And the click to run packages now, by the way, they include the, the volume licensing, the perpetual activation uh, ones as well. So if you're doing, whether you're doing Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise, or even a 2019 volume license, like that's all done here. Wow. So this is something that uh, we actually, we, we spec a lot of this stuff out in my transition moving from Windows into Office, um, but you can select all of the, you know, the up, update channels, which products you deploy. Like this is basically the governing, governance of what will be laid down on your computer once you actually deploy Office with, um, with the, the XML file that this outputs. And then the other cool thing that you can do, and this is kind of tying back into uh, the kind of the Intune side. Oh, hang on, hang now, on. Go, go, go back to screen oh, and scroll up. My sure. favorite feature is that you can ha also have it pinned to the taskbar. I yes. love that because that was yes. something we heard from a ton of folks. So if you scroll down, you're over on the right, uh, up a little bit, up, <laughs> it's over on the right. A little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Right there. on the right. Oh, you're talking yeah. about the the, yep. the yes. so you can as part of the installation. Yeah, you can actually have it pinned to there. the taskbar, which is huge. And folks were asking that, how do I immediately make folks know that that's there? That you can now do that as part of that installation and log it, and make sure that that's happened. Can we right, right. briefly and kind of discuss what's the what's the end user experience for this and for endpoints? So you sign in with your work account on a Windows PC or mobile device. Uh, policy occurs. How, what's the what's the look here for Office? Is this something you get as part of that process? That's going to be automatically deployed to the desktop when they sign in for the first time. This is when I when I push when I'm doing push style deployment. I'm provisioning it out through um, say configuration manager. Okay, so they'll so get it automatically. So this ingests the the output as an XML file, and then basically I say run. Um, run the ODT, the Office deployment tool, which is the command line interface for this. I point it to this XML file, and this is basically the instruction set that says, here are the packages that we want, 32, 64-bit. Do we want to omit any apps? What's the update channel that we're going to write to the registry? Yeah. Um, do we want to have, you know, this is the package, for example, that uh, enables the service for Microsoft Search that we saw earlier. So I can have I can have that actually even set my, um, my browser or my, my search engine defaults. All of that's done through the through the push style deployment. Um, yeah. The thing like that you can do, though, sort, which I think sort, is sort of like the old cool MPT for self scripts, but just so right. much easier to do and not having to write it all out. Right, right, and you don't have to. Before you had to kind of author all of this stuff in a in an XML file with Notepad. You know, yeah. like if you didn't, yep. there were there were some GUI tools that we'd built that were like on GitHub and stuff, but this is much easier. And you actually you can see we were able to save different deployment files. But I think to your other question is the user, so let's say user has got admin rights and they log, they sign into Office 365 and I open up the, I open up the Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise package for them to self-install. Mm -hmm. Well, basically I can, um, I can go in and actually set up policies for, um, for those machines that connect as well. So um, let me, let me go into policy management, I was trying to, let me, let, me op let me open up the policy first. But basically this will do things like uh, uh, give you the ability to configure whether or not um, the machine can run macros or do any of the, um, you know, we can we can actually set policy of the, the behavior of, of the computer um, when they're signed in. So here, let me try this one more time. I think that this um, this control didn't, turn on which it should have we just create a new policy um i'll cancel out of that and this is where you can define who who will get set and then if i search for users we'll just add a security group and now here are those policies that you can do 
Um, but you'll see there's literally hundreds of policies that we can set. So the cool thing is if I'm logged in with my um, domain credentials for uh, Microsoft 365, it will actually snap the device to the policies um, that are configurable through through this tool. So once I deploy these out and I've targeted them to my right security group, you can see um, you can see, for example, some of the things that we can do. If I search for, let me just search for macro. I'll search for macro, and you'll see that you know block macros, set VB, VBA macro um, controls, all these things that I can do directly from policy management. And this sits up in the cloud again as a as a package that gets that gets um, kind of pushed down to the to the client endpoint, and then it's going to snap to what you what you how you want it to behave effectively as an IT admin. And again, that machine doesn't have to be domain joined. It doesn't need to be enrolled even into uh, Intune or, or have any management affinity. It's literally because I've signed in, I've brokered that connection and that trust with Azure AD. These policies that you define here will get pushed down to that machine so you can actually protect an unmanaged computer who's using effectively your managed set of software, yeah. which is your Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise. Yeah, so this combines with what we talked about earlier, this notion that someone's pulling a laptop out of a closet, getting it up to date, Right. And uh, at that point, because they've signed in with their work account, they can get this automatically deployed. Exactly. Uh, to the system. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, we need to address the last big topic, uh, which is something that just came up recently at uh, Build. It was a discussion around virtual, uh, Windows virtual desktop, uh, this notion of uh, Windows hosted in Azure. Yeah, how, how I, does how does this change things? I'm a huge fan of this, and this is something where even last year at Ignite in our booth, we were showing off uh, plugging an Android phone into a USB-C hub with a keyboard mouse monitor, Ethernet, and running a full version of Windows 10 mm -hmm. in the cloud through that and using it like a fully functional PC. What's great is our customers that are E3, E5 for Microsoft 365 licensed automatically get this. And what's awesome is you really have two kind of key ways you can use this. Either A, you can push out to somebody a full Windows 10 desktop using the same deployment tools that you use today. And what's great is they're gonna get that Windows 10, it's gonna have those apps, you can run it through the browser, you can run it through the, um, you know, through a remote desktop app on any platform. I've been using it on my Mac with the new uh, keyboard and mouse setup. And you now have this self-contained Windows instance that you can't drag and drop things to the local desktop. So for those who want this either A, great experience or want a secure experience you have that or you can push out just specific apps this is awesome if you're using two apps two different versions of the same app you're going to go to a new one you can say hey you can continue to use app version one until july 1st here's the new one take the training start to use it and that version will go away plus we've also um, extended support for windows 7 on by leveraging Windows Virtual Desktop, which means if you have apps that only run in Windows 7, it was the only thing holding you back from migrating to Windows 10, you can continue to use those in a supported manner as you start to build those out as either uh, you know a new app or a cloud-based app, et cetera. So for customers that were spending a lot of money on third party, it's now included, you're just using Azure uh, as a way of hosting I mean, that, but you is... have that amazing level of control it's rather incredible i mean for for people who have been around for a while like me unfortunately um you'll remember the microsoft uh desktop optimization pack had two mm -hmm. forms of virtualization it was the application Appy virtualization and Medby, and Medby yeah. right mm -hmm. exactly the enterprise so this is a, a combination of those capabilities right app and desktop virtualization yep. but delivered through the cloud mm -hmm. that's incredible yep. Yeah, so, and then the other thing is just the ease of provisioning. So once once you wire in effectively your directory service against Windows Virtual Desktop, you can start to create your host pools, which are those VMs that you can assign to multiple people. One of the things that's unique here is we have multi-session, uh, kind of the Windows 10 Enterprise multi-session support. So you can have multiple users logged into a client operating system, so you don't have to use a server for that capability. Um, which is nice because you don't have any like trade-offs in terms of uh, usability. 
And, you know, you can do all of your management here from one place in terms of assigning the different compute, assigning the users, uh, the apps. I've actually got a, an app here um, of a legacy app that's a beautiful looking old uh, Contoso invoicing <laughs> app. But you'll see that, um, you know, because of this, I can do things like run if I want to, like you said, a down level version of Windows or an app that maybe I, I don't trust or want to have provision running uh, on people's devices, but I want to have that on a very locked down kind of sandboxed Windows environment that's that's fully contained. So now I'm actually launching this this app. You know, the first the first sign into this VM is going to take a second because it's actually kind of spinning everything up. But then once I'm in, um, it's literally just cutting out that window of the app that's running in that version of Windows. So this is actually in it's a like VM an and it behaves, you know, yeah. like it's running locally. The only evidence you can see here is this glyph that's on the um, mm -hmm. start menu icon that it's a virtual app. So all of this stuff works and it's great, great for testing. It's great for, you know, compatibility reasons, great for having just more control over where some of these apps run so that you have full visibility into what's on that operating system. And so now this, you've got cross-platform compatibility instantly yeah. as well. So exactly. this is something you're running directly from the browser. Uh, it's not uh, necessary in this case. No, you know, this, is, this is a, well, this I'm sorry, is running I should over say, uh, RDP, I mean, sorry, but it's, sorry, it's mean, basically a, a link that's, you know, it's here. Oh, in it's my, actually in, in your, okay, page. I was going to say, okay, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. I thought you clicked the link on the web page. Uh, you got you it. Can, you can yeah. do, yeah. Um, there's you, basically, you, if you go to right. aka.ms slash WVD web, and I don't mm -hmm. have all my creds memorized, but um, you can actually go in through an HTML5 browser, do the same thing, the app window or the, or the full desktop from a browser as well and not have to have the um, remote desktop client configured on the machine. Right, gotcha. but okay. but the whole goal is that, you know, for end users, they don't care how it works, it just has to work. And this is one of those where they see the icon, they click it, it oh, works yeah. like they expect. They don't even realize it's not a locally connected app as long as they, you know, the only time they're gonna realize it is if they're on a laptop with no internet and they go to launch it, it'll say sorry. And that's about the only time, but no matter whether it's through a browser you could be on a Mac and have it through Windows Virtual Desktop or have it run the same way where they click that app and it runs out. So that's what's great is it's the seamless experience for end users where they don't even realize it. And that's awesome. And Honestly, yeah, just included. having, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's it. I mean, just having the app that you want, uh, this is what's going to delight people. They'll see it come up and say, oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> right. You know, they don't, they don't exactly. really care where it's coming from. No, they don't. And that's the whole great thing is now it's also secure. You can also add additional things saying, look, I don't want any files being saved locally from this. So if you've got a sales guy who's using some, you know, sales app like Goldmine or Act or even an old version, if they're running it this way, when they go to export it, it's not going to show them the local C drive. They won't be able to get to it. So now you've also ensured that the content will stay within the app itself and not be downloaded locally or a database can't be exported, things like that. So you start to get levels of control as you do this. And like I said, I could do this from a mobile phone, plug it into a hub and then use it just like a PC without it being any difference. And we've mm -hmm. run AutoCAD from this because it's the cloud that's providing all the processing power. It's not the phone, the phone's just redrawing. So as long as it has a decent graphics capability, it'll mm -hmm. work great. Yeah. We are living in the future. We are. Yes. Where's my jetpack? <laughs> exactly, flying cars. We were awesome. promised. We were promised. That will be, you know, I was told in 1977 the world will go metric and except for needing, you know, Coca-Cola, yeah. we don't use anything in that. I was terrified that somebody would need a hectoliter of blood. I wouldn't know how much that is and they would die. That was life in 1977. Yeah. So I realized a hectoliter of blood is a, it's a I lot. I think we were, we were all handled the, or handed the, the, the the rulers, <laughs> you know, yes. with most measurements and said, you got to learn it? this. And then we have jetpacks and yeah. jetpack is still not here and we have not gone metric. The rest of the world has, just not us. <sighs> I'm actually a fan of metrics. So I have to. <laughs> have to well, of course no, you are. I, I mean, it, you know, it's much we, should, we should be fans of anything that is 10 based, right? Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's how many fingers and toes we have, most of how us. Many, so. How many hands are is a horse tall? Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Or how many well, there is the notion of a finger of alcohol. Right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which, exactly. Um, which I always questioned, you mean a finger width or a finger length? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. anyway, so we covered a lot of ground today. Um, and 
Jeremy, I, it's really good to catch up with you. I have a very uh, long-lasting memory of you uh, convincing me to wear a parachute outfit uh, for a skydiver's outfit for a yep. a bit that we did that I will never forget. So thank remember, you for that. That was for Click to Run. We we wanted to show that you could install Office in the ninety seconds or so of free fall from a plane without internet yes, connectivity. Yes. That was the whole point of that one. I did draw the line at jumping out of the plane, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. I'll always have that. So thank you. And Stephen, uh, obviously, always always a pleasure. Thank you guys so much. Thank and thank everyone for tuning in uh, to this latest episode of the Microsoft 365 Knowledge Series.